Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis by mail to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913-15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. You can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. Just go to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for this week's episode of Tales of the Texas Rangers. The original air date, January 28th, 1951. And the title is Blood Harvest. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Texas Rangers starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Blood Harvest. It is a moonless midnight, September 16th, 1947. A truck without lights is parked in a cultivated field several miles from Fairvale, Texas. In the darkness, two men are perspiring freely as they load bales of seasoned alfalfa onto the truck. How many more we got to go, Slim? Uh, Fifteen, twenty, that's all. Uh, Now we can get it all on here, then. This will be the last load. That suits me fine. The sooner you get off the place with it, better. Come on. Whoa, take it easy, will you, Slim? How about time out for a smoke? A smoke? Are you out of your mind, Trent? Oh, we're a half mile from the house. And besides, you said Mullen was asleep. Look, don't give me an argument. All right, all right. But I moved more than 200 bales of this stuff tonight. I'm going to rest for a minute. If you don't like it, load the rest out yourself. Okay, don't get hot about it. I'm just as tired as you are. Sit on a running board. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Mullen's sure going to be surprised when he gets a look at this field tomorrow. Yeah, he sure is. What do we get for this stuff? About $30 a ton. Ain't bad. Bound to clear almost 200 bucks a piece. Yeah. Could make more than that running a couple of head of cattle without working up this pig sweat, though. Sure, smart guy. Run cattle and get picked up and sent to the pen. Maybe there ain't as much money in alfalfa, but one thing about it, there ain't no brand marks on the bales either. Nobody can say it ain't yours once you get in the clear with it. Yeah, I guess you got a point. Think Mullins liable to suspicion you when he finds his field stripped tomorrow? Oh, not a chance. I'm an old war buddy, ain't I? And he saw me taking a sleeping pill before we turned in tonight. <laughs> At least he thinks he saw me take it. <laughs> Good thing he ain't seeing you take this alfalfa or you'd lose your job for sure. After tomorrow, I can afford to lose it. The farm work ain't for men, it's for horses. Hey, come on, we rested long enough. I want to get you away from here. Okay. <sighs> Hey, give me that pitchfork. I'll push those last two bales back and make more room on the tail of the yeah, truck. here it is. I gotta act real surprised tomorrow. I... What's the matter, Slim? Shh. There's something moving. I don't hear nothing. There it is again. Maybe it's Mullen. Maybe he woke up. Keep quiet, Trent. Who's on this field? It is him. Shut up. You better answer me. I can see the outline of your truck. Slim, I gotta start up and get out of here. No! <laughs> he woke up. You must know I'm not in the house. So pile in the truck and come with me, quick. Hey, go to jail, lady, you fool. No. I'll slide around behind the truck. You stay here until he comes up to you. Yeah, but I... Don't... Do as I tell you. 
Who are you? Talk up fast. It's me, you Mullen, Harry Trent. Harry Trent, huh? You lost, Trent? What are you doing in my field in the middle of the night with a truck full of my alfalfa? Uh, oh, well... Save it, Trent. Where's Slim? Where to run to? I didn't run any place, Mullen. You know... Don't move. There's a pitchfork you feel against your ribs. Just march back to the house. What are you going to do to him, Slim? I'm going to lend him my bottle of sleeping pills and see to it that he takes an overdose of them. It's nice, clean, and quiet. That idea'd be great, Slim, if I'd hold still for it. But I ain't about to hold still. Look out, Slim. Punch him, Trent. Let go of that fort, Mullen. <laughs> now, Mullen, here's something you don't have to hold still for. <laughs> but you'll hold still this time. <laughs> you killed him. You killed him. You shut up. Stop that and shut up. <laughs> oh, we gotta run, Slim. We you gotta do nothing. Get that load out of here and sell it like we planned. Then keep your mouth shut. If you don't, I'll shut it for you. Just before dawn of the next morning, a hound from a neighboring farm came across the body of Robert Mullen. Its baying attracted its master, who called the sheriff. The sheriff requested aid from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. There's a body, Ranger. Black hound dog over there came across it this morning, set up a holler. Owner heard her, knowed she'd found something and come around. I see. Which one owns the dog? Fellow in the Mackinac, Sam Richardson. His farmer joins this one along the east fence. Who are the other two men? Harry Trent. Farmer on the north is his, and Slim Fireman. Slim worked this place with Mullen. They was buddies in the war or something. You want to talk to him? Yeah, in a minute. Anybody touch that pitchfork? Nope, not even me yet. I figured it must be the murder weapon, blood all over the prongs. Hard to read prints off that handle, though. Yeah. Marks on the body show Mullen was jabbed twice. Once would have been plenty. I, uh, sent for the J.P., but I don't think we need an inquest to tag this as murder. No, but he'll have to order a medical examination to establish the time of death. Hmm. Hmm, Mullen felt kind of funny. The left leg bent in under him. Well, there's a reason for that. Pull up the pants leg and you'll see. Yeah. That explains it, all right. Artificial leg. He in some kind of an accident? If you can call Okinawa an accident, you hit the beach there with the first Marines. Lost a leg and an eye. Left eye's glass. He could have picked an easier life than farming. Did he have any family? Sister, Ellie, lives over at Holtzville. Guess I'll have to bring her the news. You could call the local minister at Holtzville. He can tell her better than you can. And we can drive over and see her later and find out if she knows anything. That's a good idea. I'll talk to these other fellows now. Okay. They uh, don't seem to know much, though. They may know when Mullen was last seen alive. There's not often a man gets pitchforked to death out in his own fields. Yeah. Uh, fellas, uh, this here is Ranger Jace Pearson. Ranger, this is Sam Richardson. Howdy. Hello. Harry Trent. Hello. Slim Fireman. Glad to know you. Richardson, the sheriff tells me your dog found the body. That's right. Oh, it must have been about uh, 4 a.m. I was just getting out of bed when I heard her, so I come a-running. You always run out and investigate when you hear one of your hounds baying? Nope, but that black hound of mine's a good one. And I ain't never heard a dog sound off like she did. I see. When did you see Mullen last alive? Yesterday morning. Pass each other along the fence and said howdy. How about you, Mr. Trent? Uh, I hadn't seen him for a couple of days. Reckon Slim here saw him last then. How about it? Well, sure, reckon I did. Last night we ate and then I turned in early. Hmm. Then this happened during the night. Must have, far as I know. Why would Mullen come out to this field at night? <laughs> I don't know. I didn't even know he'd left the house until Richardson here come pounding on the door and woke me up this morning after he found the body. You live right on the place, Slim? Uh-huh. How come you didn't hear Richardson's dog? Well, I am sleeping kind of heavy. I took a sleeping pill last night. Must have knocked me out good. Had a rough day yesterday. What do you mean, rough? Well, all the extra chores, loading the alfalfa from this field onto the truck. I was wondering how come there were so few bales from such a big cutting. Well, Mullen had a buyer for most of it, I reckon. Anyhow, he carted it off. Yeah, I see the tire tracks. Any idea who he sold it to? They didn't say. Think somebody paid him for the stuff, then came back to rob him of the money, Jase? Could be, Sheriff. 
except that Mullen made the robin mighty convenient by coming out into this field at night. When we learn why he came out here, we'll be learning a lot. <laughs> After a while, the justice of the peace showed up and took charge of the body. The sheriff made his call to the minister at Holtzville so he could break the news to Mullen's sister. He gave her a couple of hours to get a grip and then drove over to see her. <laughs> he, was, he was only here last Sunday, spending the day with him, playing with a baby, arguing with Dan. Who's Dan? My husband. What were they arguing about? I, I didn't mean a real argument. Politics. Cost of living, you know how men get talking. <laughs> and now he's dead. Take it easy, Ellie. <laughs> That's your brother's picture over the fireplace, isn't it? Yes, it's in his uniform. Just before he went overseas in the war. Before he was hurt. Anybody you know of who might gain anything by having your brother out of the way? No. He never made any enemy. Guess it was robbery like we figured before, Jace. No money on him and none in the house that we could find. Mm, might have had time to bank the crop money yesterday. We can check that with the bank. Might as well go, then. Ellie, you shouldn't be here alone at a time like this. The minister's coming back later. Why don't you call Dan and have him come home from work? He's away for a few days on a business trip. Mm, away on a business trip, huh? Who's he working for? He's buying and selling for Hatton's Feed and Grain Company. Don't worry about me. I'll be all right. Well, if there's anything I can do, just holler. Bye, Ellie. Goodbye, ma'am. Goodbye. You, you got to find out who killed my brother. You can't let him get away with it. We'll try not to, ma'am. I never thought how her husband's job might fit into this. Buying and selling feed and grain, huh? Mullins sold that alfalfa. Most likely man he'd sell it to would be his own brother-in-law. It's something we're going to check on. Hop in. We'll put out a radio pickup for him? No, oh, we'll drive over to the Hatton Feed and Grain. They'll know where he is. We'll pick him up ourselves. Hatton's Feed and Grain Company told us the area that Mullen's brother in law, Dan, was working. We caught up to him next morning making a selling stop at a dairy farm. That must be Dan's car there by the barn. Hatton Company emblem on it. Yeah, let's find him. There he is. Other end of the barn, leaning on the stall. Must be the owner he's talking to. Call him down here. We don't have to. He sees us coming this way now. Watch out for any sudden moves, just in case. Uh, Howdy, Sheriff. Looking for me? Ranger and I'd like a word with you. Uh, reckon it's about Ellie's brother. You heard about it, huh? Got my car radio this morning. I called Ellie a little while ago. She told me you'd been to see her. A couple of stops I just got to make around here, and then I'm heading for home. When did you see Mullen last? Two days ago, when I started out on this trip. You stopped by his place? That's right. Social call or business? Business. Made a bid on his alfalfa. We just about finished sweating, ready to be hauled for storage. How'd you pay him for it, by cash or company check? I didn't pay him for it, Ranger. He said it wasn't for sale. You better be sure of that, Dan. What do you mean? He means that that alfalfa was sold and moved just before Mullen was killed, the same day you stopped there. Whoever told you that's a lie. It's no lie, Dan. We saw it with our own eyes. Everything was hauled from there except maybe a dozen bales. I don't care what you saw. I know that alfalfa wasn't for sale to me or anybody else. What makes you so sure of that? I'll tell you what makes me so sure, and you can check it with the bank. Bob told me he'd made arrangements for a bank loan to buy 20 head of dairy cattle. That's why I'm sure. He was getting them in next month, and he needed that alfalfa for winter forage. He couldn't have sold it, not to anybody. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Blood Harvest, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. Mullen's bank verified the loan for buying the dairy herd. Unless he'd changed his mind suddenly, Mullen wouldn't have sold the feed he'd been needing for his own stock. The sheriff and I headed back for Mullen's farm. Don't see Slim around any place. 
Maybe into the funeral home. Let's take a look at the barn. We've looked at the barn before, Jace. No way we could miss a couple hundred bales of alfalfa. No, but we might have missed something we weren't looking for the last time. Just look up. You see the lot is almost empty. He didn't need much forage with just one horse to feed. I'm not looking for forage. Here's what I'm interested in. Just a bunch of scrap lumber. And a keg of nails. Just about what he'd need to build stalls for that dairy herd. Uh, Mullen was too far ahead with his plans to change his mind, if you ask me. Sure looks that way. Where'd Mullen keep his hay truck? That vehicle shed out back? Yeah. Come on. What do you want to see, Jace? The truck that Slim said he and Mullen loaded that alfalfa on. Looks like the shed is locked. Yeah. Oh, no, it isn't. It's the wooden peg stuck through the lock ratchet. We can pull it. I'll help you roll her back. Yeah. There's the truck. Is this the only truck he's got? Yep. If this truck was used to haul alfalfa bales, they must have been tighter than any bales I've ever seen. Look at that truck bed. Clean as a whistle. Not a straw on the floor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sheriff. This isn't the truck that was loaded out in that field. You can't be sure of that just because the bed is clean. No, but I can be sure by the tires. Look at them. Treads worn down almost smooth. The tire marks we saw out in the field were well marked. Plenty of tread. Hey, that's right. They were. Come on. Take Mullen's horse from the barn, throw a saddle on it. I'll get charcoal out of my trailer and we'll take a little ride. Where to? Out to the fields first, where I can make a plastic cast of that tire tread. Truck was loaded heavy. Impression was deep enough to hold. Why can't we drive out? I want to cut across the neighboring farms, too, and see if we can find any matching treads in other fields. We'll see the ground better as we move on horseback. Just as easy to drive around to the farms and check the tires on the trucks like we did here. Yeah, but I don't want to be seen doing that. We scare the man we're after. He might run before we get to him. Okay, I'll have this nag ready in a minute. If you're right, Jace, Slim Ferryman has been lying about moving the alfalfa. Easy, boy. We'll find out. If he was lying, it'll explain why Mullen was out to that field at night. Because it'll mean that the crop was being stolen at night. And he was killed when he saw who was stealing it. How long does it take that cast to dry, Jace? Yeah, I'll be ready in a minute. Why would be a lot of truck tires with that same tread? Sure, but this piece I'm making a cast of has a cut mark across part of the tread. Oh, I see. Find that same mark again someplace else. We can make another cast and use for evidence. Here, this is dry now. How's that, Sheriff? Good, clear impression, Jace. Come on. Let's ride. We checked the neighboring farms. Sam Richardson's place was clear, and so were the two others. And we cut through the north fence to Mullins' farm and into the acreage owned by Harry Trent. Looks like Trent moved his alfalfa crop too, Jace. Fields are clear. Yeah, Where's the farmhouse? Other side of that patch of trees. Good. That'll keep us covered. Keep your eyes on the ground. Right. Hey, hold it. Ooh. Hold it. What is it? Nothing. Tractor marks there. Not what we're looking for. Oh. Well, let's keep going. Hey, Roger. Yeah. Yep. There's quite a bit of straw on the ground over to the right, Sheriff. Let's move that way. Hey, boy. Yeah, Sharky. Yeah. Probably Trent had his bale stacked there. Huh? He sure did. That's what we're looking for. Ooh, ooh, charcoal. Ooh, oh, easy. Kind of dim, Jace, but they're the same tread, all right. Yeah, it looks like the same cut mark in the tread. I'm going to make another cast. Then after dark, we can slip in and take a look at Trent's barn and his truck. <laughs> Slipped back that night. Trent's truck tires were the ones we were looking for. Heavy duty. We went from the vehicle shed to the barn. Pretty dark night, Jase. Hardly see in here either. Yeah, I don't see enough to find what I want. There's a ladder to the left. Hi, right, here it is. All right, I'm going to climb up. Give me your flashlight. Here you are. Anything up there? Just a few bales. I reckon Trent sold most of his alfalfa crop, too. Even if he had Mullen's crop here, no way we could prove it. That's where you're wrong, Sheriff. If Trent had it, we're gonna prove it. We 
cleared the farm without being spotted. Got to my car and drove back to town. Robert Mullen's wake had just ended at the funeral home as we pulled up at the sheriff's office. We didn't have to be so careful out at Trent's place, Jace. There he is going toward his car. Must have come in to pay his respect. Uh, he just came out of the door of that cafe. Oh, look who's in there at the counter. Slim Ferryman. Yeah, we could use some coffee. Come on. Sheriff and Ranger. Howdy, May. How's the coffee? Try stirring it and it'll fling the spoon right back at you. <laughs> that sounds strong enough. Mm. Pour a couple. Yeah, all right. Mind if we sit with you, Slim? Help yourself. Yeah, got a line on who killed Mullen yet? No. Too bad Mullen never mentioned the name of the man he was selling that alfalfa to. No, too bad. You think he might have mentioned it to one of the neighbors, Sam Richardson, maybe, or Harry Trent? No, no, I don't, I don't think so. I guess it isn't likely. man who doesn't tell his plans to an old buddy living right in the same house with him, I guess he wouldn't tell anybody. Well, here's your java, Sheriff. Thanks. Ranger. You and Mullen go all through the war together? No, just part of it. Mm-hmm. Where'd you meet? South Pacific? Uh, no, here in the States. I, uh, I was a ward man at the general hospital. Oh, then you weren't in action together. No. I see. I, I thought you were real close friends. We were. Who says we weren't? Well, take it easy. Nobody said so. I just meant you You weren't as close as buddies are when they're under fire together. We were plenty close, and don't let nobody tell you different. Mullen was the best friend I ever had, see? Sure. When you get the guy who killed him, I'd... I'd like to be there to watch when they strap the rat in the electric chair. I know just how you feel. I'll do my best to arrange that for you. Um, here's your money, May. Thanks, Slim. Uh, I'm going back to the farm and get some sleep if I can. Hardly had any since this happened. It's too bad. Maybe you ought to take one of your sleeping pills. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe I will. Good night. Good night, Sheriff. Good night, Slim. You sure rattled his teeth, Jace. He was pretty frank about his service record, though. Yeah, only because he knew I could check it if he lied. Let's skip this coffee. I want to see Ellie and her husband, Dan. <laughs> Ellie and Dan were keeping a lonesome night vigil beside the body of Robert Mullen. We beckoned Dan outside. What is it? I don't want to leave Ellie alone too long. I'm afraid you'll have to leave her alone for a while if you want to help us spring the trap on the man who killed your brother-in-law. You know who did it? I think so. I need your help to prove it. You gotta help her. What do you want? How much acreage did Mullen have in alfalfa? Looked like seven or eight acres. Eight's right. You know how much it would yield? About... Two ton to an acre, 16 ton all told. That's a good yield for this year. He took good care of his land. Why? I'll tell you in a minute. Sheriff, we saw Trent's alfalfa acreage. I'd say he'd cut about six acres. But, then You don't have to say about. Six acres is right. How do you know? I bought Trent's alfalfa crop for my company. Good. How much? Almost 12 ton. Same acre yield as Bob Mullins. 12 tons. Are you sure that's all? Of course I'm sure. The feed and grain companies keep a record of everybody they purchase from? Sure. Can the lots be identified? I mean, are they tagged or stored in such a way you could tell who they were brought from? Yeah, they are. What are you aiming at, Jase? Final proof to break Trent down. Dan, I want you to come with me. We'll get one of the bales Trent sold to your company, and then we're going to wake up every other feed and grain buyer in the county to see if he sold any more than 12 tons. <laughs> got what we were after. The day after Mullen was killed, Trent had sold an additional 15 tons to another company almost 50 miles away. We got a sample bale and brought it back to the sheriff's office. Hey, put it down here, Dan. Yeah. So Trent did sell more of it, huh? 15 tons more. Don't see how you can tell this bale from the other one. You can when you weigh them. Trent's bales averaged 110 pounds to the bale on his own stuff. The bales in this second batch are tighter packed, about 140 pounds to the bale. Hey, wait a minute, Ranger. There's something else different, too. I just noticed. Look at the wire on the bales. Mm, looks the same to me. Maybe, but you're not as used to seeing baling wire as I am. Wire on the bales Trent sold me is 16 gauge. Wire on this other bale is 14 gauge. Bob Mullen always used 14 gauge. Come on, Sheriff. 
Let's get Trent and make him talk. Once he opens up, we'll see where Slim Fairman fits. Chase, I see the picture as clear as you do now, but how are we going to prove that this second batch of alfalfa was stolen from Mullen's place? We don't have to prove it. Trent's the one who has to do the proving. We do things big in Texas, but he's the first man who ever sold 27 tons of alfalfa from six acres. Let's go. <laughs> It was still dark when we turned in the road to Trent's farmhouse. And the light went on inside as we came to a stop. Trent came to the door. Oh! Oh, it's you fellas. I heard a car. And I... You thought it was somebody else? No, no, no. I didn't know who it was. Oh. I thought you might be expecting Slim Fairman. Uh, no, no. Why would Slim come here? Take a few lessons in farming, maybe? So you could show them how to raise 27 tons of alfalfa on six acres? 20... You must have raised that much, Trent, because you sold that much. The 15 tons of it belonged to Mullen. He bailed heavier and used 14-gauge wire while you used 16-gauge. Uh, I bought Mullen's crop. Why would he sell it to you instead of his brother-in-law, Dan? I mean, I, I hauled it for him. He thought the price would be better someplace else. Not enough to haul it 50 miles. And besides, you made that sale yesterday. After Mullen was killed. I had to do it. I was in a trap. If I told you about it, Slim would have killed me. Did he kill Mullen? Were you an eyewitness? Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw him do it. I never touched Mullen. Where's Slim now? I, I thought you were him when you drove up. He's coming here this morning. I got to check for Mullen's alfalfa, and Slim was going to pick it up and take it someplace for cash. And... There's a car coming now, Jace. Handcuff Trent to the door now by that closet. Quick. Right. I didn't kill Shut him. Up. Come on, Sheriff. Slim won't stop. He'll see my car as he makes the turn for the house. He saw it. He's turning around. Get his tires. That stopped him. He's running for it, Chase. Move off to that side. The car is shielding him. Right. Stop running, Slim. You can't beat a bullet. He ducked into the bullet, Chase. Circle in from the side and keep the door covered. I'm going in after him. The gray of dawn was washing across the sky, but the barn was in deep shadow. I slipped in along the side wall and moved slowly toward the stalls. I didn't see what came at me. I just sensed it hurtling through the air. And I threw myself to the side, hit the ground, and fired. You get him, Chase? You all right? Yeah. He threw that sickle at me from the stall. I didn't see him. Don't even know how I hit him. I just felt it coming and fired. Mighty good aim. He's dead. So is Bob Mullen. Let's get Trent and take him in. his complicity in the robbery and murder of Robert Mullen, Harry Trent was sentenced to Huntsville Penitentiary for 50 years. And here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae, with another interesting story about the Texas Rangers. The equipment of a Texas Ranger includes a pair of six guns, a rifle, a shotgun, and other weapons. Not to mention his horse, horse trailer, automobile, and scientific crime detection apparatus. However, there's been a fictional addition to the equipment as the result of motion pictures. An addition that has the rangers scratching their heads ruefully. It came to the attention of one ranger recently as he passed two small boys on the street. The small fry turned to stare at him. The ranger got quite a shock when he heard one of them say, Oh, shucks. He ain't a real Texas ranger. He ain't got a guitar. Well, such is the influence of modern fiction. But fortunately, the criminals know the truth. When they see a real Texas Ranger, they don't look for a guitar. They look for the quickest means of transportation. They want distance, not music. Good night, folks. See you next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of The Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. 
Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Lou Krugman, Herb Bygren, Tom Tully, Wilms Herbert, Betty Moran, and Gigi Pearson. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Al Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Here's news of two outstanding musical events. This Saturday, January 27th, Arturo Toscanini begins the first of a new series with the NBC Symphony. And starting Monday, January 29th, the Boston Pops Orchestra will be heard in a new Monday evening concert series. They call infantile paralysis the visible crippler. It strikes without mercy any place, anywhere. You can fight him with your dimes and dollars, though. Send them today to your local March of Dimes headquarters. Join the 1951 March of Dimes. Remember, Arturo Toscanini once again conducts the symphony next Saturday on NBC. Welcome back. Okay, I know this is a serious program, and I know the idea I had would ruin the dramatic tension. But at the start of the program, when they were talking about how much money they were supposed to, they were expecting to get from the alfalfa, I just wish one of them would have said when the money was quoted, and that ain't hay. Okay, and maybe I'm the only one on that. It's always interesting to hear how criminals plan for a crime to go and why they think they're going to get away with it. And they, you know, and on Tales of the Texas Rangers, they tend to have some expertise in the area in which they're committing the crime. But there are other factors they haven't thought of that the Rangers have. And it's fun to see how that plays out. I also really loved the closing story. That was cute. And certainly singing cowboys were very popular. You know, Roy Rogers was huge. Gene Autry. Uh, but there was a host of lesser knowns as well. And the idea that some kids thought real cowboys and real Texas Rangers sang, that's just a cute thing and an interesting artifact of that particular a time in America's culture. All right, well, now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to David, Patreon supporter since March of 2021, currently supporting us at the Chief of Detectives level of $30 or more per month. Again, thanks so much for your support, David. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, please be sure to rate and review it wherever you download your podcast from. We'll be back next Saturday with another episode of Tales of the Texas Rangers. Uh, but coming up on Monday, we're going to check in on Casey Crime Photographer, where... Come in quick, Ann. Mm -hmm. Let me close this door. It's dark in here. Someday you're going to get into trouble for opening doors that you have no right to open. The cops expected to keep people out of Milton's apartment. They should have done a better patch-up job on the door. The fireman busted down. You know, I expected a cop to be on guard out there. Yeah, so did I. Homicide guys went over this joint so thoroughly, I guess Logan figured there was nothing to guard here. Yeah, they went over it so thoroughly that I can't imagine us finding anything that they missed. They didn't know what they were looking for. Do you? Mm -hmm. Not exactly. Well, never mind. Don't waste time talking. Now, let's see it. Cops and the killer didn't search where? Um, uh, how about the plumbing? Eh, hiding stuff in pipes and sink traps. An old gag. You can bet Logan's guys used their wrenches here. Yeah, seems to me they and the killer didn't overlook any possible hiding place. I think they did, Annie. Hmm? Annie, look, the fire didn't reach this bedroom. And the curtain on this window is still in place. Well, nothing could be hidden in that curtain. It's net. We can see right through it. Yeah, sure, but the metal rod it hangs on is hollow. Hey, that's so. Well, let's see, anyway. Tubing isn't even fully closed in the back. Mm -hmm. It's an extension rod, see? I'm going to pull it apart. Annie! What? You found something? Look! What is it? It's film. Rolled up film. The roll's no bigger than a cigarette. It's stuck in the end of the inside rod. Where do I unroll it? Mm -hmm. It's negatives. 35 millimeter negatives. Four, five, six of them. Uh, what are the pictures on them? What can I tell in here? We'll take them out in the hall where there's light. Uh -huh. Casey! Oh. Who are you? No! Don't hit me with that! Oh!
I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.